So we are in session 20 of a 26 session class. So you know what's coming, right? A whole lot of, lot of crap is gonna hit you in the last few weeks. And it won't be just me, I'm sure every class you have stuff coming due. So I just want a reminder of what's left in this class. Next Wednesday, you have your third quiz. So I will send out the review session and stuff. It will cover only the capital structure section which is basically the second packet. But that's a, a little bit misleading because we still don't know how to lever on and unlever betas. It's going to get in the way of doing capital structure. So that's coming next Wednesday. Then of course, you've got the final project due on the last day of class, May 9th. And then the final exam, the actual scheduled date is May 16th. But as I said, there will be an earlier for versions, if you want to take it May 12th, you can get it out of the way and get out of here if you need to. So that's what's left in this class, but that's a big chunk of your grade, right? It's 10% for the quiz, 30% for the final, you know, 30% for the final project. That's 70% of your grades still left, which is good news and bad news. Good news, we need to dig out of a hole. Bad news, we you think you're already on top of the mountain. So either way, the rest of the class is ahead of you. So what do you guys think of what's happening at Twitter? From a corporate governance standpoint, forget, I mean, let's face it, this is really a political story now. It's not a business story. It's not a finance story. Which way you're going to go on this depends on which side of the divide you're on. I'm not going to go there. But from a corporate governance standpoint, of course, the board of directors adopted a poison pill, right? What does a poison pill do? Anybody? Yeah. It makes it more difficult for an acquirer to acquire your company, right? So let's play. I mean, ultimately, if you think about Twitter, it's a publicly traded company. It's not a it's not a benefits corporation. And if you're a publicly traded company, at least based on the, the legal structure, 
that we operate in. The board of directors is supposed to have a fiduciary responsibility, primarily to whom? Not to the employees, not to the company, but to the shareholders account. And you can already see why this is really tricky, right? Right now, the stock is trading at 42 and somebody offers 54. You've now got to convince me, I'll play the role of your shareholder. Tell me why this poison pill is good for me. I mean, you're trying to convince me that not taking $12 more is good for me. This is quite a mountain you're going to climb. You've hired Goldman Sachs and they will say whatever you ask them to tell you. So, don't, you know. so tell me what the pitch is going to be to me to convince me that this is good for me. Anybody want to try? Go ahead. Well, when you guys read the part of the Elon Musk taking over the company will destroy equity value in the long term. Doesn't matter. I mean, in a sense, long term is, as I said, as Kane said, we're all dead. So first, if you, if you use the word long term, you've lost me. As a shareholder, I'm saying, what does long term even mean? How long is long term? So it's got to become a little more short term. You can quickly get the stock value above it. Okay, that's the argument they're making that the intrinsic value, the, this is absurd if you think about the basis of the argument because these are people who've never really understood the concept of intrinsic value. So one notion is if the company were run better, it could be worth more. And, and you know what my response to that is? Who's been running the company so far? You see why Twitter is on a really weak. It's one thing when you have a new management that's come and say, we're going to change the way the company is run. Parag Agrawal is not a new manager. He's essentially been part of the Twitter management now for a long time. So making the argument that we could be worth more if we're run better is a really difficult argument to make if you've been running the company all the way through. So that's going to be tough to pull off. So what else can you try? If that doesn't work. You can't make the intrinsic value argument. You got to hope that another acquirer will show up who will pay more, right? So that is really the potential saving grace for Twitter. And if somebody else pops up, Silver Lake or a private equity investor, I think a second group has become involved and is willing to pay more than Musk is, then it gives them an out. But if that doesn't happen, the board of directors is going to face some incredible pressure to take the poison pill out. It's happened before, where if you get enough pressure building up on the company, the board will have to reassess it because the Delaware courts are going to say, you're supposed to be running the company in the best interest of the shareholders. So I think Twitter's problem is their history. Their history is they've always had potential, they've never delivered. And because of that, any argument they make about we can deliver becomes less credible. So there's a third possibility, which is Twitter brings in new management. Say, okay, the existing people didn't pull it off. We're gonna bring in a new management and this new management can do it for us. So this game is a long way to go to play out. Okay? But as you watch it play out, think about the corporate governance issues. This is essentially what we're talking about. We have board of directors, we have management, we have shareholders. Now we have a hostile acquirer the question of where this game will end up will, will be determined by who do you trust most. Yes. Is there any, uh, I guess, water in the argument that Elon Musk, by not disclosing as he was accumulating the investment, is also a problem for shareholders that they were not correctly compensated? Well, that's a, that, that's between him. So there is a lawsuit that shareholder. I'm not sure what that argument is, though, because you're not required to disclose every investment you make until you get to insider status. There is no SEC requirement. So when you go from one to 2%, two to two and a half percent, there's no disclosure requirement until you get to the SEC's definition of insider, which I think is 5%. You don't have to disclose. Now, I don't know how quickly Musk went from five to nine point something percent. If that happened over the course of a couple of weeks, there is no basis for the pushback because the insider disclosure laws essentially are, you know, don't run in instantaneous time. They often run two to four weeks yeah. So I'm not sure because that we don't know how we accumulated that percentage. And incidentally, I've, you know, I have to check this on Bloomberg. Musk is not the largest shareholder in Twitter. Vanguard is the largest shareholder in Twitter. In other words, there are a lot of institutional players who are standing on the sidelines right now. 
this game is not really between Twitter, uh, between Musk and Twitter's board. It's between whether Twitter can win these institutional investors to come to his side or stay on Twitter's side. That's the game being played out. So if you know this morning he threatened a tender offer with, with Musk, you'd never know. Is this all a game for all you know? He might say tomorrow, hey, that was a nice game we played, let's move on. Uh, I'll try Disney next. But I think it's going to be interesting just to see the game play out. So let's talk about capital structure. Any other questions? If you have your mic open, could you just uh, mute it please on, on Zoom? So let's talk about optimal capital structure. Last session, we talked about the cost of capital approach to finding the optimal. And for Disney, the optimal is 40%. Then we tried the enhanced cost of capital approach. We brought an indirect bankruptcy cost. It made the drop off much steeper, but it was still 40%. Today, I want to talk about a third way of assessing the right mix of debt and equity for your company. It's called the adjusted present value approach. It's an approach that was developed in the University of Chicago in the late 60s and 70s. And it's still taught as gospel to a lot of University of Chicago MBAs and other schools that use that same approach. So let me describe what the adjusted present value approach tries to do. In the adjusted present value approach, the way you come up with the optimal is you first value the company as if it has no debt. It's called an unlevered firm value. We'll talk about how to do that. And then you bring in the effect of debt by actually computing the dollar value benefits and the dollar value cost of borrowing money. What am I talking about? The biggest single benefit of debt is a tax benefit. So it adds the tax benefits from debt. And the biggest single cost from borrowing money is an expected bankruptcy cost. So when you borrow 10 billion, here's what I do. I compute the tax benefit from the 10 billion. I compute the expected bankruptcy cost created by borrowing the 10 billion. I set them off against each other and say, this is what your new firm value will be if you borrow money. So it's pretty straightforward. Instead of trying to minimize the cost of capital, you do the unlevered firm value and bring in the tax benefits and bankruptcy costs of debt. So let me lay out the three steps that you would need to use the adjusted present value approach. The first step is you got to tell me what the value of your company would be if you had no debt. And there are two ways you can do this. One is to do a full-fledged valuation of the company. We take the cash flows before debt payments, so called unlevered cash flows, and discount them back at what your cost of capital would have been if you'd been a 100% equity-funded company. Let's play that out. If you're a 100% equity funded company, what's your beta going to be? It's going to be an unlevered beta. Your cost of equity will be based on that unlevered beta. There is no debt, so that'll become your cost of capital. So one way is to do a full-fledged valuation. The problem with that is, that's a lot of work. So I'll give you a shortcut. You know the current value of the company with the debt it has, right? Think of that as a levered firm value. What if I could net out from that value the effect of debt? By doing what? Taking out the tax benefits and adding back the expected bankruptcy costs. In other words, I take the existing firm value and say, if this company had no debt, what would the unlevered firm value be? So that's step one. And I think we can get that. We have the, me the mechanics for doing that. The second step is computing the tax benefits from debt. Strictly speaking, what is the tax benefit of debt? You take the interest expense, you multiply by the tax rate, that's your tax savings next year, right? And if you save this every year, it's a present value of those tax savings over time. And in fact, if you make simplistic assumptions, that tax saving can actually, if you take the present value, will be equal to the tax rate times your dollar debt. It's a present value for perpetuity. So if you have a $10 billion of debt and a 40% tax rate, you will actually save $4 billion as a present value so if you work out the interest expenses every year forever, take the tax savings every year forever, calculate the present value, you get the tax benefits of that. Now, if you want to make that a little more sophisticated and put in growth or changing debt over time, not a big deal, but tax benefits of debt are also pretty straightforward. You can compute them. And then you get the expected bankruptcy costs and you open a Pandora's box. Why? Because bankruptcy costs take the form of direct and indirect costs. And we already talked about how fuzzy indirect bankruptcy costs are, how they can vary across companies. But to estimate the expected bankruptcy costs, you need to estimate a probability of bankruptcy at every level of debt. 
And we'll have to talk about whether we can do that. And what the cost of bankruptcy is in terms of direct and indirect costs. Expected bankruptcy costs are really messy to calculate. So here's what happens to the adjusted present value approach of the APV approach in practice. People compute an unlevered firm value. They add the tax benefits of debt, and then they get to the expected bankruptcy cost, and they say, this is really difficult, we'll just ignore it. Let me ask you a question. If your version of APV is unlevered firm value plus tax benefits of debt, and you ignore the expected bankruptcy cost, how much should you borrow? I've given you the good stuff, right? I don't take out the bad stuff. Not surprisingly, every LBO guy you run into likes the APV approach. Why? Because you can get to 95% debt and it still looks good because you added all the good stuff, you're ignoring the bad stuff. I am sure you will run into people at work, wherever you end up working, who push for the APV approach. Give them the rope to hang themselves. Say, okay, let's try the APV approach. How will we go about it? Unlevered firm value, then they'll talk about the expected tax benefits, then they'll wave their hands about bankruptcy because they let, let's ignore it. And that's the point at which you've got to take your stand and say, we can't do that because if you do that, then it's not a way of computing how much you can borrow. So I'm going to flesh out the details of how, if I were to use the APV approach, I would, I would come up with expected bankruptcy costs. There are two numbers I need, right? One is a probability of bankruptcy. The second is the cost of bankruptcy. Here's how I'm going to assess the probability of bankruptcy. I'm going to come up, remember we came up with the synthetic rating at every debt ratio when I did my cost to capital approach. I'm going to do that every debt ratio. And then I'm going to use that rating to compute a likelihood of going bankrupt. You're saying, how do I convert a rating? We have a lot of history on each ratings class, triple A, double A, single A. I can go back over history and say, if you're a triple B rated company, here's your chance of going bankrupt. So I can assess the property of bankruptcy. On the cost to bankruptcy, we know the direct cost, the actual cost of being in the legal system is about five to 10% of that. So that's pretty stable across companies. The indirect bankruptcy cost rate can range from a low of five or 10% for a grocery store to 30 or 40% for an aircraft manufacturer. So I make my best estimate of what that cost is. I don't want to go down this road anyway. I'd prefer the cost of capital approach, but if you push me down the APV road, I have no choice. I've got to come up with the estimate and come up with an expected bankruptcy cost. So here's the property of bankruptcy number. It actually comes from something that Ed Altman actually has been updating now for almost 35 or 40 years at Stern, where each year what he does, he goes back and collects bonds that were rated a decade prior. Then he classifies them based on ratings class and looks at the likelihood or the percentage of bonds within each ratings class that default over the next 10 years. So among the AAA rated bonds at the start of the period, only 0.07% default, but that's actually surprising. Even AAA bonds, if you track them 10 years, some actually end up defaulting 0.07%. As the rating decreases, the default property goes up. S&P and Moody's also report this on a continuous basis. I'll send you the links if you want. If you tell me the rating for a bond, I can tell you the likelihood of default over the next five or 10 years. So as my rating decreases, the property of default goes up. Any questions on this? So this is purely based on historical data, but I'm going to convert my synthetic rating into a likelihood of default. So let's try this on Disney. So right now we have two estimates or two ways of estimating the optimum, both gave us 40%. Let's try the APV approach. To try the APV approach, the first thing is I need to estimate what the value of Disney would be if they had no debt. To do this, I'm gonna start with the existing market value of the firm, 137. So that is just the market value of equity plus debt minus cash. So I have the existing market value. And what's the question I'm asking? If I had no debt, what would the value be? So let's play that out. If I have no debt, I will lose the tax benefits on the debt, right? 15,961 is my existing debt. 36.1% is my tax rate. That existing tax benefit would go away. So that's why I'm subtracting out the tax benefit. But the plus side is if I don't have that debt, I would not have the bankruptcy cost from that debt. The rating I think was single A, based on that rating, the property bankruptcy was 0.66%. 
So I'm adding back the expected bankruptcy cost by saying, if I hadn't borrowed the money, I wouldn't be exposed to that bankruptcy risk. So is everybody clear? The signs might look like they're in the wrong direction, but I'm just taking out the effect of that. What I end up with is an unlevered firm value of 132.3 billion. Why is it lower than my existing value? Because by paying off the existing debt, I lose a lot more, the tax benefits than I gain in terms of bankruptcy costs. So I've got the first leg of the APV, the unlevered firm value. Now, if I, if I wanted to, I could do it the long way, actually compute a value for Disney with expected cash flows and using the cost of capital as the unlevered cost of equity. But this is much quicker and much cleaner as my starting point. Any questions on the unlevered value from the existing market value? Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, that, I should have mentioned that. That is basically my estimate of firm value. Remember I said the range, but five to 10% is direct. That's going to be for every firm. The question is, what do I add to the 10% to get to total bankruptcy cost? If this were Boeing, I would probably add 30% to come up with a total 40%. If this were Kroger's bank grocery store, I'm at only 5%. Disney falls somewhere in the middle. It's not as immune as Kroger's, but it's not as exposed. Yeah. So that's the subjective judgment. I'm completely open about the fact that I have no idea how to estimate it more precisely than that. Okay. And that's one reason I'm reluctant to use the APV approach is this number, which is a big number driving value, is kind of a fuzzy number. But at least I'm trying. Most people use APV, actually ignore this entire bankruptcy cost. I'm at least trying to bring it in. So now let's work out what the value of Disney would be at every debt ratio. So unlike the cost of capital approach, where I try to minimize the cost of capital, here I'm looking at the total value of the firm. So if you look at the unlevered firm value, the base is always the same at every debt ratio. That doesn't change. At every debt ratio, I compute how much dollar debt I'm going to have. If I have the dollar debt, I can get the tax benefits from that debt, right? Just the tax rate. Notice that at very high debt ratios, I start to lose tax benefits. So I'm actually taking the exact same output that I use for the cost of capital approach and using it differently. So that's because my, I, I run out of operating income for my interest tax savings. So there's my tax benefit. It actually gets capped at 70%. And at some point it actually starts to decrease because I just don't have the income to cover the, the interest expense. So there's my tax benefits. My synthetic rating, basically the same way that I got it for the cost of capital approach. But in this approach, instead of using the rating to come up with the cost of debt, I use it to assess the property of default. So if you're wondering where that number comes from, it comes from this table. Where if you know what the rating is, you can assess that likely. You multiply the unlevered firm value by the property of default, there's my expected bankruptcy cost. Early on, it's tiny. And as with the cost of capital approach, notice the cliff you hit around 40 or 50% debt. If you, if you take the unlevered firm value, add the tax benefits and subtract out the expected bankruptcy cost, there's my value for the firm at every debt ratio. And what's the objective in corporate finance? Maximize the value of the business. Well, this is pure coincidence, but it turns out to be 40% again. For Disney, all of the approaches kind of lead you to 40%, with the caveat that if you go a little bit above 40%, bad things can happen to you. But don't expect that to happen for every company. Some companies, the approaches can give you different numbers. And here the big number that's driving my optimal is what I compute that 25% bankruptcy cost. If you try 40%, the optimal will be lower. If you try 15%, it'll be higher. It's very much a function of what I think the bankruptcy cost is going to be. So the APV approach, again, you're trying to maximize firm value, just getting it, getting to it differently. Unlevered firm value plus tax benefits minus expected bankruptcy cost. Yes. Is it worth giving yourself a cushion? Like that's we haven't said anything about should Disney go. In fact, for all three approaches, I've said the optimal is 40, right? I haven't said, should you go up to 40? That's going to be the next part of the analysis is should you even try to get off where you are right now? Maybe we'll conclude for some companies that even though they're massively underlevered, that it's better for them to stay where they are than try to push to the optimal. So separate what you compute as the optimal from what you might advise a company to do, because for different companies, that advice might be different. So cost of capital approach, enhanced ca cost of capital approach, APV approach, 
But let's look at the way in which most companies end up setting their debt ratios. I would love to tell you that they optimize cost of capital or do an APB analysis, but they don't. Most companies, you ask them, why do you pick the debt ratio that you do? The answer is, it's because everybody else in the sector does the same thing. Telecom companies, why do you borrow so much? Because everybody else borrows so much. Tech companies, why do you borrow so little? Because everybody else borrows too little. So let me ask you a question. What is it? And this is not just in capital structure. It turns out to be true in dividend policy and even in investment analysis. Why is me tooism such a strong force in business? Why do you want to be close to the average when you do things? What's the benefit? Anybody want to try? Why, why is it safer to be close to industry averages than go try to do the best thing for you as a company? It becomes kind of a shield when things go wrong. What, I'll give you the, the, the potentially good reason. One is the kind of a law of large numbers, right? With a lot of companies in a space pick something, it must be right. Otherwise, why would they pick it? Same reason. When you pick a movie to watch, you pick a Rotten Tomatoes of 80% or higher. It's not like everybody else knows something that you don't, but there's some collective crowd wisdom you believe. But in the case of companies, the problem is when you have very divergent companies to pick that crowd wisdom might not be the most sensible thing. So the second reason you do it is something goes wrong, your defense is hey, everybody else was doing it. It's the same defense that a six-year-old gives when he or she comes home and a parent asks, why do you do that? He said, because everybody else was doing it. To which you get the classic response of, if everybody else jumped off a bridge, would you jump off the bridge? Sure, if you have any normal six-year-old, the answer is, of course I would. I don't want to look strange. There's nothing deep about this. Companies pick staying close to averages because it gives them safety. Safety from being fired, not safety for the company, but safety from being fired. So I can see that. In fact, take that as a given when you're making recommendations for company, if you're asking them to do something that's very divergent from what everybody else in the sector is doing, your sales pitch just got a lot more difficult. You can't tell people they're being irrational. You got to incorporate what they're worried about into your recommendation. So let's step back. Given that companies want to be like everybody else in the sector. Let's add some layers of sophistication to that analysis. If you're a company that has much higher tax rates than everybody else in the sector. So let's say the rest of your sector is in Ireland and you're the only German company in the sector. Even if you want to be like everybody else, I'd push you to borrow more and I'll tell you it's because your tax rate is higher. If you're a company with much less inside ownership than the rest of the companies, that added discipline argument applies more strongly to you than it does to the rest of the group. If you're a company with more stable income than any other company in the sector, even if you want to be like the sector, I'm gonna push you to borrow more. Do you see what I'm doing? I'm taking the industry average and pushing you either above or below based on the specific characteristics of your company. This way you bring in what managers worry about into the analysis but you also add a layer of common sense saying, it's okay to be in a sector and be a little different if you can explain. Because what are they looking for? When those equity research analysts get up and say, how come you borrowed more money than the typical company in the sector, they can give a reason. You're looking for what is that reason that you can give for being different from the average. So I took my four companies, four public companies, and there are their debt ratios. And notice I have book and market, debt to capital, net debt to capital. Why am I throwing four different measures? Because when you talk about being like the peer group, you want to use a debt ratio that everybody else uses. So if everybody else uses net debt to capital, you're going to use net debt to capital as well. If everybody else uses book debt ratios, you're going to use them as well. With these four companies, though, I got a little lucky because I got pretty much the same answer no matter which measure of debt ratio that I used. Let's take Disney. On every measure of debt ratio, I get lower numbers than I get for the industry. So if I'm looking at Disney and I'm looking at the industry, it looks like Disney has less debt than other companies in the sector. So there's 22.88% there. No, so never. 
How does this help me? Remember, I'm trying to get Disney to borrow more money. Now I've added ammunition. I can say, look, by borrowing money, you're going to look more like the sector. That part is going to sell easier than showing the cost of capital going down because that says that gives them cover. If I look at Bali, on pretty much every measure of debt ratio, they have more debt than the sector. And if I remember for, for Bali, they came in as over levered when I did the cost of capital. The debt ratio was higher than it should be. Here again, you get a convergence between what you're trying to push the company to pay, to pay off a little debt and that industry average. For Tata Motors, on pretty much every debt ratio, they're higher than the average. Again, that's consistent with what we found with the cost of capital approach, where we found them over levered. And with Baidu, they're pretty much where they should be. The industry has low debt ratios, and they have low debt ratios. As I said, I got luckier because in every one of these companies, what the industry was doing helps me on my sales pitch. You, could, you should need to borrow more for Disney and borrow less for Vale and Tata Motors and for Baidu, you're pretty much where you should be. But if nothing else, you need to be aware of what the rest of the peer group is doing. Before you walk into a company and say, you should borrow more you should, or you should borrow less because there will be that question of how will we look if we do this? Will we look strange and how do we explain it as to why our debt ratio is different? Now, there's a slightly more sophisticated way you can bring in this pure group assessment and the differences across your companies. Now, in your statistics, you might have seen multiple regressions. Multiple regressions basically help you explain a dependent variable. In this case, the variable I'm trying to explain is the debt ratio. And I know differences in tax rates and how much cash flows a company has and how stable earnings are can affect that debt ratio. What if I took, let's say you have 50 companies in your peer group. I took their debt ratios and tried to explain differences in debt ratios across the companies. Do you see what I'm trying to do? Instead of just using the average debt ratio as my target, I'm saying, let me look at differences and see if there's something I can learn about why different companies have different debt ratios. Of course, once you decide to use data, you are a slave to the data. You can't say, I expect to see this because the data is going to tell you this matters and this doesn't. You're going to end up with a regression equation across your sample. If you plug in your company's tax rate, its earnings variable and its EBITDA, as a principle of firm value, into the regression, you will get a pure group debt ratio, but a pure group debt ratio that adjusts for the differences between you as a company and the rest of the peer group. I know it sounds abstract, but let's try this with the automobile business. I want to see if Tata Motors is under levered or over levered relative to the typical automobile company. I collected a sample of 56 automobile companies. Again, remember, this is a fairly trivial thing to do. We have S&P Capital IQ, you just go in, download the companies that are in the sector. I came up with the, the debt rate, I you know, measured the debt to capital ratios in market value terms for each of these companies. The effective tax rate, the EBITDA is a principle of enterprise value in CapEx. And let me give you the intuition behind why I chose those. I use the tax rate for obvious reasons. Higher tax rates should lead you to borrow more money, bigger tax benefits. I pick the EBITDA because it gives me the cash flows you have to service the debt. Remember we said that's one of the measures that allows you to have a higher debt ratio. And I looked at CapEx because we have a lot of capital intensity as a company, even if you have a lot of EBITDA, that money might have to go into the CapEx. You can't afford to borrow money and add to your fixed cost. So if you put those numbers together, here's what I ended up with. The higher my tax rate, so the, uh, the, my, the higher my debt ratio, the higher my cash flows, EBITDA, the higher my debt ratio, and the more CapEx I have as a company, the lower my debt ratio. That's across the 56 companies. Truth in advertising requires that I tell you that the R squared is only 21%. Am I disappointed? No. With data, you can't be disappointed. It is what it is. It's telling you there's a lot of variation across debt ratios across automobile companies that you cannot explain with fundamentals. It's kind of a warning sign about being, you know, if you use pure group debt ratios, you get a low R squared, you're going after an average where there's a lot of variation across companies. The T statistics were all statistic, so they were all signif statistically significant. So I left the regression as is, plugged in the numbers for Tata Motors, tax rate, EBITDA, and CapEx into the regression. And I got a predicted debt ratio 
of 18.5%. Based upon how global automobile companies are setting the debt ratios, Tata Motors should have a debt ratio of about 18.5%. Its actual debt ratio was 29%. Again, I'm reinforcing what we found with the cost of capital approach. The cost of capital approach, I think the optimal is 20%. They were at 29%. Now I'm saying not only are you over levered based on the cost of capital approach, you're over levered relative to the typical automobile company based on your characteristics as a company. Any questions on that regression? So I mean, running that regression, basically the data is there, you might as well try it. Uh, could you explain why you use capex by enterprise value also? Well, capex basically as a measure. If I if I if let's say I have substantial capital expenditures, I've got to make that cash flow every year. If I borrow money and add interest expenses to the capex, it's much more of a cost. It it adds to my cost structure. So I'm going to be more reluctant, holding all its constant, to borrow money on top of a capital intensive business. It sounds almost counterintuitive because a lot of capital intensive companies borrow, but I think they do it for the wrong reasons. They say, what other choice do I have? And here the data seems to suggest, at least in the automobile business, companies with a lot of CapEx tend to be growth companies. So maybe those are the kinds of companies that shouldn't be borrowing as much to get to the art. Yes. Hi, Professor. Yep, go ahead. Uh, hi, Professor. I have a question, but more general question about relative analysis for debt. Yeah, I think some companies take a lot of pride in taking the minimum amount of debt or no debt in their business. I'm curious, do you see that as a sign of perhaps lack I of understanding so. of corporate finance or is there also benefit with regards to maybe more like self-control when it comes to borrowing and putting yeah, the company at risk? Now, before you go on, if this is your own business and you want to borrow no money, I'm going to say, great, amazing. It's your own company. You want to be conservative. But if you're a manager of a publicly traded company and you choose not to borrow money, who's bearing the cost of not borrowing money? Who's losing tax benefits? The, manager, the shareholders, all right? What do the managers gain? They get to run this nice, comfortable company where there's no pressure on them because of debt. I am paying so that you don't have ulcers mm -hmm. as a manager. And that I think is not right. So if you want to not borrow money because it makes you more comfortable, don't strut around saying, look how well I'm managing your company, I have no debt. It's not your company. It's a shareholder's company. You're turning away tax benefits because it makes your existence a little easier. So I don't think you can use that argument unless you have a really, unless you have a really good financial reason for not borrowing money. One could be flexibility, the other could be agency costs. So let's talk something real and say, that's why I'm not borrowing money. I'm willing to accept, but you can't just say I'm not borrowing money because borrowing less money is better than borrowing more money. That's not true in businesses because you're giving up the tax benefits. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Somebody, you had a question, go ahead. Uh, what do you think? This is a big decision, right? It could be billions of dollars. Isn't this why I'm paying managers at a company to make these decisions with all the information they have? I mean, I'm not saying they do it, but I'm saying they, this, they should be looking at their cost of capital. I mean, their defense might be, that's too complicated. Nothing we did was rocket science. Right? So I think companies should be doing it. Are they actually doing it? Probably not. Because they use the industry average, they go to the average, they stay with the average and say, look, I'm safe. So I think there's a lot of laziness when it comes to capital structure and it ends up biting them. Any other questions? Now, once I decided to do that regression across the sector, I said, why stop there? Why not look at how all US companies are setting their debt ratios? You see, once you run a regression, how your sample can now become the entire market. So every year I run a regression, you can get the 2021 version on my website and I'll send you the link of debt ratios of all US companies against tax rates. And I throw in a bunch of variables that I think should matter based on the trade-off. 
So the tax rate is in there to capture the tax benefits, the growth is in there to capture the agency costs and the flexibility. The institutional investment is there to capture the aid, you know, the, the, whether you need the discipline from debt. And finally, the EBITDA to firm value is there to capture the cash flow. So each is there for a reason, to capture a trade-off and run the regression. Again, truth to that, does it. regression R squared is 8%. What does that tell you? There's a lot that happens on debt ratios across companies you cannot explain with fundamentals. Companies choose all kinds of debt ratios for all the wrong reasons. But each of these variables, if you look at the P-statistics, is significant. It is still a regression I can use. The predictions I'm going to come up with will have a big range. Why? Because the R squared is only 9%. Or I'm sorry, it's only 8%. But I can plug in the numbers for any company. In this case, I plug them in for Disney. And I got a predicted debt ratio of about 19%. So what, what, if, if I asked you to describe what this 18.86% is to somebody who's not familiar with regressions, how would you describe this 18.86%? Let's say it's 2015, I run the regression, I plugged in the numbers for Disney into the regression, I get a predicted debt ratio of 18.86%. Given how other US companies are borrowing money, and given your specific characteristics as a company, this is what your debt ratio should be. This has nothing to do with minimizing cost of capital or increasing firm value. It's got to do with, if you want to play the pure group game, I'm saying, let's make it real. Let's look at every aspect of the pure group, not just this lazy industry average. And if you remember, Disney's debt ratio was lower than 18.86%. It's not as high as the optimus we came up with, cost of capital approach. And maybe this is a way in which you can buffer your optimal. Say, look, 40% is your optimal, but given how the companies are behaving, about 20% is where you should stop. It gives you added ammunition when you think about what should we do at Disney. Yes. Isn't this, I'm, I'm just thinking as a normal shareholder, what do we need as knowledge? You have, you're acting like you don't need to do the whole regression, right? No, I'm just saying it's better than say in industry averages because you don't want to look at the like the rest. Well, I think then I said as long as you explain why you're different, I think you're okay, right? I mean, in this case, what am I doing? And the 18.86% is not going to push them to some, I mean, if it gave you a debt ratio of 88%, of course, you have a lot of explaining to do. 18.86% is not a whole lot of explaining, right? You say, look, I'm a big company. I'm in five different businesses. My income is more stable. I think people underestimate the intelligence of shareholders and they do it deliberately. They act like everybody's stupid, so I can't do anything that's not stupid because if I do something that's not stupid, all these stupid people will punish me. And this is a vicious cycle, right? Because stupidity then breeds more stupidity and the whole thing blows up. I think we've got to give people the capacity to at least make the right decision. And to the, for, but you'll have to give them the information. Say, Look, I'm higher than my industry average, but let me show you how much more stable my income is. That's the storytelling part. That is your job as a company. And I think it's your obligation to tell the story. Maybe shareholders will still punish you. But I think we've got to at least give them a chance. Any other questions? So what I did was I took for Disney. Now, th there's an actual debt ratio, 11.58%. And if you look at all the different ways in which I computed the optimal on every single approach, the optimal, my conclusion is, you can borrow more money, you can borrow more money, you can borrow more money. In the case of Vale, with every approach, the optimal, unless I normalize earnings with a higher iron ore price, you're over levered, you're over levered, you're over levered. Not by much, none of these companies is wildly, outlandishly under levered or over levered, but clearly Vale comes out as over levered. Tata Motors, same phenomenon, over levered. Baidu, maybe slightly under levered, but pretty close, right, 10% as opposed to 5.23%. So you don't have to try every approach for your company, but I think you have to have it in your arsenal just in case. So you might never use the APV approach, but there will be other people who use the APV approach and you've got to be 
ready to ask the right questions. You might not believe that you should be like the peer group, but others will say, I want to be the peer group and you have to be able to ask the right questions. And maybe they will still do the industry average because that's where it's safest for them. But at least you did your job of saying, what about the fact that you have a higher tax rate? You have less variable earnings. Why are you still at the industry average? And when your industry gets very divergent, take tech, right? Tech 40 years ago, every company was high growth, high risk. Tech now includes mature tech, which has some of the most stable, predictable earnings of any company out there. And you've got very young tech where you have money losing companies. Picking an industry average seems like a very strange way to run the debt ratio for your company. And I think a lot of tech companies, it's leading them to strange places in their debt ratios because they're focusing on what the rest of the peer group is doing. Professor, I had a question. Go ahead. Uh, so you've been obviously following D, um, Disney for a while now, probably a couple of decades, if not more than that. And you've presented to Disney a couple of times as well, if not more. What is their response to this? Like, why, 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 why do they say that they're not levering up? Why? First, they need to, don't need to respond to me, right? So if they, unless they get the pushback from investors, they don't have to respond. They've had to borrow at, at regular intervals. In fact, for a period in the middle, they borrowed a, a fair amount. The reason their debt ratio is back low is because the market cap has risen again. And today their argument might be, look, we have Disney streaming. It's a very risky, negative cash flow business. We don't want to risk the business by going out and borrowing money. And that's probably a pretty good defense. And that goes back to the earlier question. Once you have the optimum, can you have a good reason not to go to the optimal? And I think you can. And for Disney, at least for the moment, that might be the good reason. If Disney Plus continues to underperform and underdeliver, that reason is going to run out. And then they're going to face pressure, not from me in a classroom, but from a call I can borrowing money, you know, taking a position in Disney saying, why don't you guys borrow more? Because eventually that's what ends up happening is you're a mature company and you continue to borrow too little. We'll talk about the pressures that will build up on you. Well, it's not that you choose to borrow money. You'll be forced to borrow money because the pressure will build up on you having to borrow money. So let's structure, let's think of where we are. Now. We've got the right mix of debt and equity, but I want to talk about what to do next. Once you've got this mix of debt and equity, what do we do with that mix? Okay. So try this out in your company. I don't know how many of you try, had a chance to try the capital structure spreadsheet. But at the end of the analysis, decide where you are. You, you know, one of three things is going to be true for your company. Your company is pretty close to its optimum. In which case, what should you do? Obey the Hippocratic oath, do no harm, just walk away. It's amazing how often consultants and advisors feel the urge to ask companies to do something because they feel if they don't do that, they haven't you know, earned their key. If your company is at, and when I say at the optimal, I mean, remember we walk, you know, we move in 10% increments. So your optimal is 30%, you're at 26%. You're close enough to the optimal. There's no point pushing. So that's the first possibility. The second is it has too little debt. Maybe your company's under level, like I found for Disney. Or it has too much debt, it's over level. If you're gonna have a problem, which one would you rather have? Too little debt or too much debt? It's an easy one. It's better to have too little debt. Your choices are so much, so much richer than you have too much debt. And the next step in the process, is assuming your actual and optimal are different, there are two, two decisions you got to make. First is how quickly, if at all, do you want to move to the optimal? This is a variation of the first question. And I've got my optimal, I've got my actual. Do I need to move in the next three months, the next three years, the next 30 years? How much time do I have? And the second question is, how do I move to the optimum? And I'll give you multiple mechanisms you can use to change your debt ratio. And you have to decide which one's right. For you. So let's, let me set up the framework that I use when I see a company and I'm trying to assess it's you know, what, in actual versus optimal. So first step is look at the actual debt ratio you compare to the optimal. I'm going to look at only the two cases where it's different. If it's at the optimal, the, the framework is done. But let's say you're under level, the better problem. If you have too little debt, the first question I'm going to ask is, are you potentially the target 
of an acquisition. Why would having too little debt make you a better target for an acquisition than if you have too much debt? What is it about having too little debt that makes you attractive to an acquirer? I can finance the acquisition using debt and guaranteeing that debt with the, with the company that is under leverage. So I basically push down the debt to the target. Okay, let me give you an analogy. The analogy is not going to go all the way through, but hang in there anyway. Let's say you buy a house in the tri-state area. It's going to cost you what, two million probably? And unless you're a drug dealer, you got to borrow a lot of money to buy the house. Let's say you borrow 80%, you buy the house, but then you're very frugal. You pay off the mortgage in five years. You now own the only all equity financed house in your neighborhood. And you decide to have a mortgage burning party. You guys heard of these in the old days when people lived in the same house for a long time. You had a 30 year mortgage. You actually stayed in the house for 30 years. And the last mortgage payment you actually invited all the neighbors over for orange juice and coffee cake and whatever, and you physically burnt the papers to show that you were free of the bank. Once in a while, you burnt the house down, but that's kind of our, you know, tragic when it happens. So you decide to have a mortgage burning party, and you decide to invite all your neighbors, including your next door neighbor, Bob, who's never liked you. He doesn't like the way you cut your shrubs. He doesn't like the way you mow the lawn. He just doesn't like you. But he shows up anyway, it's free food and free coffee. And while he's eating your coffee cake and drinking your orange juice, he's plotting his revenge. So right after the party, here's what he does. He goes to the friendly neighborhood bank and he says, look, there's this all equity funded house in my neighborhood that's worth $2 million. Will you lend me money against the house? This is where the analogy starts to break down. You go to a bank and you try to borrow money on your neighbor's house. What's the response you usually get? That's not your house, but let's say this is your friendly neighborhood banker. He says, Bob, okay, you can borrow 1.6 million. The house can carry 1.6 million. So Bob has now borrowed $1.6 million against your house. He now decides to do a hostile acquisition of your house. Again, I'm not sure how you pull this off. Maybe he approaches your kids and asks, do you want the basement for yourself? You can have it as a game room, just sell your share of the house. And let's say your kids have no loyalty. They sell their shares. The next day you wake up and Bob now owns your house. He's evicting you. Thank God this can't happen with the house. But this can happen with the company. Let's say you're the CEO of a publicly traded company who's going around bragging about how conservatively the companies run. You never borrow money. You hate that. It's a $10 billion company. It could afford to borrow $5 billion. It's chosen not to borrow the $5 billion. I see the company. And I try out what Bob did. I go to a bank and say, will you lend me money against the company? The bank's probably going to say the same thing to me. It's not your company. Until the early 1980s, when a guy called Mike Milken and Drexel Burnham created a market that allowed me to get around the tyranny of the neighborhood bank. What did Mike Milken and Drexel Burnham create? That they created the junk bond market. Remember, junk bonds have always been around. What was different about Drexel Burnham's junk bond market is it allowed companies to have original issue junk bonds. So the way bonds became junk bonds pre-1980 was you started at investment grade and you slid. But what Drexel Burnham said is you can issue bonds that are below investment grade and people will buy it. Why? If you offer an interest rate high enough. You see how this helps you? You're an acquirer, you've done this before. You've seen this $10 billion company you can afford to have 5 billion in debt. You issue junk bonds, why? Because initially it's, there's no security behind it. You don't own the company, but you say, look, look at my track record. I will find a way to buy the company. Of course, I promise you a 15% interest rate. You, issue, you, you, you buy the bonds from me. I raise the 5 billion. I do a hostile acquisition of your company having borrowed money against your assets. But here's where the final insult comes in. You're a very conservative CEO, right? So in addition to not borrowing money, what have you very conveniently accumulated in the company for me? A nice big cash balance. And you know what I do with that cash balance? I take the cash balance and pay off the debt I took using your assets as collateral. It can't get any sweeter than this. You essentially grease the skids for me. I can do everything based on the fact that you made it easy for me. 
So when you're a deeply underlevered company, my first question is, are you potentially the target of a takeover? You say, how would I ever know that? Let's look at some of the factors that are going to play. Let's say Microsoft is underlevered. Probably is mildly underlevered. Is it the potential target of a? No, it's $2 trillion. Who has $2 trillion? So first thing you're going to look at is the size of the company. It used to be that if you owe more than 20 billion, that you were safely out, you know, you were, you, but that cap keeps going up each year. Now you can be 50 billion, 100 billion even, but one thing that's going to matter is how big are you as a company in terms of market cap. Second, you're probably also going to look at my past track record, right? And here's why it matters. And this is happening in Twitter as well. Every hostile acquisition is a fight between two sides. On the one side, of course, is the acquirer saying, trust me, I will deliver a higher price to you. On the other side is the management saying, trust us, we have plans, we will deliver a higher value to you. And for once in your life, you as shareholders get to decide who to trust. So let me tilt the scales a little bit. Over the last five years, your stock price has been down 60%. Who are you gonna trust? The management that says, we have great plans for you, or the acquirer says, take the money and run. In every hostile acquisition, your past performance comes into play. So if in the past you've had trouble matching your peer group, delivering returns, you're much more likely to be the target of a hostile acquisition. And there's a third factor. It goes back to our corporate governance section. If you've got a lead shareholder who happens to be part of the incumbent management, so if you think Facebook is under level, it's not a whole lot you can do because either you've got this share structure that's tilted in favor of voting shares, and Mark Zuckerberg is not just the leading shareholder, he's also the CEO of the company. So you're going to look at the size of the company, you're going to look at the structure of ownership in the company, the things you looked at for corporate governance, and you're going to look at how well or badly your stock has done relative to the market after adjusting for risk. Does that sound mildly familiar? Didn't we measure something already that captured that? Remember when we did the beta regression, we had a Jensen's alpha? I'll give you the trifecta that should terrify if you're an undelivered company. You're a small to mid-sized company with very low insider holdings and a big negative Jensen's alpha. You don't have time as an ally. You got to do something fast. Don't sit there plotting five-year or 10-year plans. You could be taken over tomorrow. So the first step of do I need to do something quickly comes from answering that question. So start thinking about your company. If you find it underlevered, take it through that three, three questions. Now, how big is it as a company in terms of market cap? What's a holding structure, the shareholder holding structure in this company? And what's its sense and self? And if you have to do something quickly, then we'll talk about ways you can adjust the debt ratio overnight. Yes. So do you think a lot of companies are also backed by government, even though they perform, like Deutsche Bank, even though it hasn't performed in like years, it is backed by the German government? Lot is a, I mean, in the US, very small subset, right? Maybe in some markets it's, but even in, in emerging markets, when you say backed by the government, backed in what sense? Is the government going to step in and change the rules to protect you? If that's the case, maybe. But they, can't, they don't have the capital to come and stop a hostile acquisition. Okay? Governments are perpetually underfunded. They don't have the money. So unless they, and some countries, you're right, the governments can step in and tilt the rules in favor of incumbent management. And what does it mean? Whatever is locked in in the status quo will stay locked in in the long term. In fact, there was um, many European countries had restrictions on hostile acquisitions. The very word hostile means the acquisition be shut down. And that effectively would shut the process down. So a European company could stay under levered a lot longer than a US company in the 1980s and 90s. We'll talk about what in Europe changed that pattern. And uh, you know, I'll use the example of Telecom Italia in 1997 of how it changed the rules for the game, even for European companies. So that's the first stop. You need to do something quickly. If you're a small company, not much inside a holding, negative Jensen's alpha, you got to do something quickly. If you have the luxury of time, then I'm going to ask you a follow-up question. 
do you have good projects? How do I answer that question? What do I look at to make it? Because if, if I just ask managers, do you have good projects? You know what the answer is going to be every single time. Of course we have good projects. But you need to trust, or you can trust, but you need to verify. So what are you going to look at to see if they're on solid ground? Again, something you already looked at, right? With Disney, mm -hmm. I looked at the return on capital versus the cost of capital. You see how things accumulate as you go along. By the time you get to capital structure, you should have a pretty good assessment of how well or badly your stock has done, how well or badly your company has picked projects. And if you can pick projects which are good projects, you got a double whammy. You got debt capacity and your projects are good projects. Here's what my advice to you is. Go borrow money and take those good projects because increasing your debt ratio will increase your firm value because your cost of capital is lower. But on top of that, what are you going to get if you have good projects? You're going to get the positive net present values of every project that's out there. So if you're a company with great <coughs> projects and you have debt capacity, I'm not going to ask you to buy back stock. I'm going to ask you to go out and take projects and do it over time because you have the luxury of time. But you need the luxury of time. If you're under pressure, you don't have the luxury of sitting there and let me take projects over the next five or 10 years. If you don't have good projects, then I don't think you have a choice. You got to borrow money and pay dividends or borrow money and buy back stock. But because you're not under any immediate pressure, you can do it again over time. The nice thing about doing it over time is if you made a mistake, you've overshot or undershot in the debt ratio, you can adjust over time. When you do things right away, you can overshoot, you can make a mistake. So if you have the luxury of time, take advantage of it. So any questions on the underleveraged side? Hopefully, I would, my guess is about 60% of you will find your companies to be underleveraged. Take them through this framework and decide for yourself whether time is on your side is working against you. Let's go to the other side. And this, as I said, is the less attractive problem to have. What if you have too much debt? Here again, I'm gonna ask you a question about urgency. Do I need to do something quickly? And here there is a mortality question to answer. If you have too much debt, what do you worry about that you might not make it through? Are you under threat of bankruptcy? So how would I know? One obvious way is if you're rated by a ratings agency and the rating has gone to triple C, don't sit there asking, could I be go bankrupt? Yes, you could go bankrupt and very quickly, you need to do something quickly. But even if you don't have a rating, you know when you're in trouble. If any of you have worked at companies that are in financial trouble, you know very quickly, right? The free coffee disappears and soon bring your own toilet paper. And you know the, the whole thing starts to spiral very quickly out of control because clearly the company is having trouble going day to day. And if you have too much debt and you worry about going under, you got to bring your debt ratio down quickly. And to me, this is, I think the most difficult task in business is to lower the debt ratio when everybody knows you're in trouble. Give me some of the pathways and we can talk about what the constraints may. What are some of the things you could try? You're the company in trouble. You need to bring your debt ratio down quickly. What are some of the things you can try? Start selling assets. Start selling assets. Sell me the impediments. So everybody knows you're in trouble. You try to sell assets. Fire sale. It's a fire sale. Your bargaining position is shot to hell. So when you go asking 100 million, you get offered 20 million because they know you're desperate. So you can try selling assets, but you're selling them at way below what you can get, often because you're desperate. So you can try. And maybe if you have liquid assets, a lot of people demanding it, Maybe you can get away, but if you don't, you're gonna have real trouble raising money. What else can you do? Restructure debt. But tell me what the restructuring means. How do you, so you approach the debt holders and what do you offer them? Uh, higher interest rate. Or, or you ask them, you know, it's a one-year loan. Can you add a zero at the end, make it a 10-year loan? Rate, you can't offer a higher interest rate because you can't pay. You offer them lower interest rates. You're saying, why would they accept? What choice do they have? This is one of the great ironies of being a borrower. Your bargaining position is maximized just before you go off the cliff. Because what do you threaten the lenders with? If you don't agree to my terms, what do you threaten to do? You threaten to go into bankruptcy court. You know what happened there, right? I think that was a dog. You threaten to go into bankruptcy court. It's an awful dog. I don't know, something's happening back there. So. You threaten to go into bankruptcy court and you use the leverage you have 
to get the best terms for yourself. So you can try to restructure the debt. Can you issue equity? I mean, that seems like a, you know, can you issue equity to pay off the debt? You can try. Can you imagine trying to issue shares if everybody thinks you're going to go bankrupt? I'm sorry? Nobody will take it. So effectively, you you know, you this is why so many trouble companies end up trying to get lenders to accept these terms that they normally wouldn't. And there are case studies of what lenders will take. And I'll give you a few examples. In the late 1800s, one of the Latin American countries, I don't know which one, had borrowed money from a French bank. And the Latin American country got into trouble. They couldn't make their payments. And those days, ships carried messages back and forth. So the French bank sends a message by ship saying, your interest payment is due. This is the great thing about getting those, those notices by ship. Is you can, I wasn't there when the ship landed. When was that, three months ago? But eventually, the message goes to the country that your interest payments are due. You know what the country did? It loaded the ships up with guano, which is just bird droppings. Great fertilizer. And they said, we don't have the cash to make interest payments. Would you like take bird droppings instead? You know what the French bank initially said, right? We're a bank. We don't take bird droppings. And the country said, do you want bird droppings or do you want nothing? The bank thought about it for a moment and said, we take the bird droppings. I'm surprised that Greece didn't try olive oil and wine at the peak of the crisis. Would you like some olive oil instead? But basically my point is when you're a borrower on the verge of bankruptcy, you use whatever ploys you can to survive. And often that means lenders take terms that they otherwise wouldn't have. That's if you're under bankruptcy threat. But lots of companies which are over levered and many of the companies you find over levered are not under immediate threat. The ratings are triple B, you know, single A even. So they're not under immediate threat, but clearly they have too much debt. There again, my question is, do you have good projects? Why? Because if you have good projects, here's what I suggest you do. Fund them disproportionately with equity. Use retained earnings. Cut back on dividends. Because over time, what's going to happen? You don't have to pay off a dollar in debt. If your equity rises, your problem will go away. If you have the luxury of time, that is the most painless way to get out of debt. Is just grow yourself out of the debt problem. But you need time as your highlight. But if you don't have good projects, then again, you have no choice. You've got to try to bring the debt ratio down. If you're paying dividends, just stop. You're in a hole already. It's not worth making the hole deeper. Take the money, use it to pay down the debt. At some point in time, you can go back to paying dividends, but that's a framework if you have the luxury of debt. So if you think about what, what we're doing here, we're essentially asking two questions. How quickly do I need to move? And if I decide to move, how should I move? So let's try this for Disney. Disney, when I looked at it in 2013, was under level. 12% debt versus the optimal of 40%. And you're using multiple approaches. So clearly it seems under level. Is it under threat of bankruptcy? Not in 2013. Why on multiple levels? It, had, it was a market cap of 130 billion, so big company. Not, of course, Amazon, no, Microsoft levels, but still big. Second, it did have a really positive Jensen Alpha. I don't know whether you remember, but the Jensen Alpha over the previous five years was 9.02% a year. They made 9.02% more than expected. So if Bob Iger had gone in front of shareholders and said, trust me, doesn't mean everybody would trust him, but he had a much stronger platform than Twitter has right now. On the insider ownership structure, there is the, the biggest shareholder was, of course, Lorraine Powell. And I think she'd have sided with management. So in 2013, my, my choice would have been, they're not under any threat. They have the luxury of time. Then I asked, do they have good projects? And at least in 2013, what I looked at was that, you know, the return on capital versus cost of capital, they're clearly making well above the cost of capital. They've done a pretty good job of pushing the return on capital up over the previous five years. And again, it's a conditional statement in 2013. If I were to write a plan for Disney to borrow money and take projects over time, whether it's Disney streaming or something else, they decide along the way. But that would be my pathway for Disney. And just to show you, even for Disney, how that pathway has shifted. The first time I looked at Disney was in 1997 for the first edition of my applied corporate finance book. 
At that time, Disney was at the peak. It, was, it had done really well. Michael Eisner had been CEO for 11 years. He turned the company around into this dynamo. He had a board of directors that was basically worse than a poodle board of directors. They did whatever they were asked to do. In 1997, he was riding high. He was not, I mean, so 97, when I looked at Disney, I said, not a target of a takeover, obviously. They're a big company by 1997 standards. The market cap was 70 billion. But six years later, when I looked at Disney, with my second edition or third edition, things had completely changed. Disney had lost half of its market cap in the previous six years. And you know why? Because Michael Eisner loaded the bets on one big acquisition of Cap Cities, ABC, and it had pay, played out. Michael Eisner was no longer regarded as untouchable. So in 2003, as I, as I wrote it, I said, you know what? It's now a $60 billion company in a market where $60 billion companies get acquired. In fact, a few, few months after that was when Comcast announced their hostile acquisition bit, which they never really met. But it opened the door to Disney can be the target of a hostile acquisition. I don't know where you would put Twitter in this process, but I think that's a key factor now in how this is going to play out is how the, you know, Twitter is viewed by shareholders, how Twitter's management is viewed by shareholders. There's nothing the board can do can protect Twitter if shareholders don't trust the existing management. Sorry, regarding the transaction that was Twitter for the project, yeah. I think they're over levered. So would that put them still in the situation? How over levered? How much debt do they have? Well, they have a negative uh, EBITDA. So they shouldn't be borrowing so they money. They shouldn't be borrowing money. Yeah. So it's not, not clearly, if Elon Musk is buying it for financial reasons, not to lever up the company, it will be to fix the operating side of the company. Right. But clearly that debt part doesn't help the narrative about existing management, right? right? Not only can you not make not make money, but you seem to be borrowing money to fund operations on which you haven't figured out how to make money. Right. So that's why I said the existing management is on such a weak platform in terms of making an argument of trust us. Could they try to grow quickly through debt as a way to just make it? How do you better? grow through debt, right? I mean, they're up, I mean, for them to grow, what do they need to do? have more advertising on their platform. For eight, for nine years, they've struggled. How do you get advertising on a platform where people don't stay on for very long? That's a basic problem. I think the, you know, the, the number of minutes that a Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp user spends the Facebook ecosystem is about an hour every day. In contrast, for Twitter, it's three to five minutes a day. Yeah. Are there people who spend hours every day on Twitter? But they're a very strange group of people. I don't think you want to send any advertising to them that is of, you know. So very few people spend intensive time on Twitter. And that's a problem they've had all through their life. So it's growth here is not going to come easily. And it's not even going to come from capital. It's from reframing the platform to get people to stay on. Yeah. So, yeah, go ahead. I have a question. As, as outsiders, yeah. What other indicators can be used to determine if a company has good projects? Because ROE yeah. and return on capital, it can get really, really murky, right? I think you can, you, I mean, on big projects, you will get clues, right? So if you look at, um, you look at like something like Shanghai Disney. There are a bunch of news stories I could pull up on what Shanghai Disney has been doing well. What's, for instance, Shanghai Disney, Disney is consistently finding that the visitors to the park spend a lot less on merchandise and food than they do at any other Disney park. That they pack their own food, they bring it in. And for Disney parks, that's a huge loss of revenue. So you can start to collect the information. You can also look at their actions. They keep pumping more and more money into existing projects. You know what they're telling you, right? Something's not working yet, we're gonna try. So California Adventure, they don't have to give you access to the books. Clearly, whatever they did in 2000 when they built the theme park, is not working, they now have to spend more money to keep it going. So there are clues you can look at, but unfortunately, none of us will be able to look inside the company to see which projects are. But remember, who makes the capital structure decisions? It's managers, and they should have access to the data. So they should know the truth, even though they might be in denial. But as outsiders, it is really difficult to assess. That is, I think, of all three aspects of corporate finance, that's the most difficult one. What is the investment quality of the company? Because A, you're trusting accounting numbers. And B, if you have a high growth company, the excuse they use is it's all in the future, it's potential. Twitter's return on capital is negative right now, right? 
But their argument is just wait, we have potential, we can turn it to profits. That's why it's about trust. Do you trust this management to be able to do it? I'm not sure. But Snapchat has done a much, in fact, the best thing probably to do is take Snapchat versus Twitter and play them out over time. Because Snapchat had a couple of really bad years. It seems to have found a way to turn things around. Evan Spiegel has done a much better job at Snapchat than Jack Dorsey slash Paragagarwal has have done in Twitter. So it'd be interesting just to take those two side by side and say, what did one company do that allowed them to succeed? And I'm still not sure with Twitter how much of this is management's fault and how much is the platform. Because what makes Twitter attractive to people is brevity and timeliness. Huh? 280 characters, you can be sitting in a cab and send a tweet out about a news story, which means it's, it's a place where you get breaking news now. If you follow sports, this is where trades get announced on Twitter, and then somebody picks it up and says ESPN picks it up. So it's become the source of news. But there's a third aspect, which is its brevity, its timeliness, and its impulse. And that's why on Thursday, when I was asked, and I got a lot of backlash about this on CNBC, I said, hey, people come to Twitter for the same reason you slow down on a highway when you see a car crash. The real draw on Twitter is when people get into fights on Twitter and you get to sit there and watch people make fools of themselves. Oh, really, you said that in, in public? Because in impulse, you say things that you, I mean, there have been at least three nominees, Biden nominees who've been, I think, rejected because of tweets they sent three years ago, five. You know. So you can create some really toxic environments, but guess what? It draws people in. So I'm not sure how you make that your business model, more school, you know, schoolyard fights. But I think that's always been the problem with the platform. And until they figure out a way to make it you know, work for advertising, it's not going to generate the revenues that they hope to. So what I'd like you to do is run the capital structure spreadsheet, come up with your optimal fair company, come up with the actual, and then go to that framework and work it through. Do you have time as your ally? And as I said, there are subjective judgments where you'll have to make, but make it based on the other stuff you've learned about the company. So when I ask you, do they have good projects? You don't have to just stay with the return on capital versus cost of capital. You can make your subjective judgments on, I think this company can create value from its projects, but that's what's going to drive what you do next. So let's talk about how to change your debt ratio. If you need to change your debt ratio quickly, let's say you want to increase your debt ratio quickly. Here's the quickest way to do it. You do a recapitalization. What does that mean? In the case of increasing your debt ratio, you go out and borrow money, and it can be billions of dollars, and you reduce equity by doing what? Either paying a dividend or buying back stock. You can do it overnight. You can change your debt ratio from 10% to 40% in the course of a week. If you want to reduce or increase the debt ratio, but if you want to decrease the debt ratio, as you saw, it's much more difficult because issuing equity to pay down debt is tricky unless you can get the lenders to take equity in exchange for debt. And selling operating assets works in theory, but your bargaining position is short to heck. So you get much less than you expect. Now, if you want to change debt ratios gradually, again, there are two routes. One is you can, you can do, a, you know, if you don't have good projects, you can use dividends and stock buybacks over time. And that allows you to reduce equity over time, increase debt over time, increase your debt ratio. But if you want to reduce the value of debt, you'll have to repay existing debt with retained earnings. You have the luxury of time, so you can map out five or 10 year plans to do this. The complication of doing things gradually is you have a moving target. You see what I mean by moving target? If you do things today, I can say, this is the dollar debt you need to get to 40%. But if you ask me, do I, if I want to get to 40% in five years, the dollar debt you will need in five years to get to 40% will be different from your debt ratio today because your company might be growing. It's not difficult, but it's a little more tedious. You've got to forecast numbers out. But it's, as I said, it's always better to have time as your ally to do things gradually. At least let me set up what we're going to do in the next session. We've talked about the right debt ratio. We've talked about what you should do after you get your optimum. Let's talk about the right kind of debt for your company. In designing debt, 
you want to get the best of both worlds. Let's talk about what the best of both worlds is. What's the biggest benefit of borrowing money again? It's a tax benefit. What's the biggest benefit of using equity? You get flexibility, right? In good times, you can pay dividends. Wouldn't it be great if we could create a cross-dressing security? Security that has all the tax benefits of debt and behaves like equity. That is your dream security. The flexibility of equity and the tax benefits of debt. You see, no way. For a century, people in public markets have, have wrestled with ways of doing this. But let's look at the reason why you want debt that behaves like equity. You have a company here. So let's say it's a cyclical company. The firm value goes up and down depending on the cycle. If this company goes out and borrows money, technically, it's bankrupt, at least in these periods where the value of the firm drops. Away. So if I borrow a debt that's fixed and my firm value goes up and down, I'm going to be in trouble in periods when the debt goes down because the value of the debt is going to be less than the value. I'm sorry, the value of the firm is going to be less than the value of the debt. Just as a what if, what if I could borrow money and it went up and down with my firm value. This is flexible debt, but the value of debt goes higher when my firm value is higher and it gets lower when my firm value is lower. I know this is kind of a dream state, but you would never go bankrupt with this company. Why? Because the debt is moving with the assets. In a long-winded way, basically I'm making an argument for this is why I want my debt to behave like my projects. So if you came to me with the company and said, tell me what the right kind of debt for my company is, I'm going to turn it back on you. And I'm going to ask you questions about your projects. So let's start with the first question. What is a typical project for you look like in terms of duration? When I ask this question of Boeing, what's the answer going to be? Boeing's probably had, what, 10 projects in its entire lifetime, the 707, the 727, the 737, the 747. Each one probably takes 15 years to 20 years of R&D another 30 years of production and 20 years of scaling down. I think the last 747 rolled out, what, 50 years. Yeah. Typical project is long-term. What does that mean? When Boeing borrows money, I would expect the debt to be much more long-term. Boeing was one of two companies in the late 90s that had issued 100-year corporate bonds. Disney was the other one, but Boeing was one. You can see why. In contrast, if you're Cisco, what does a typical project look like? It's technology, much more short term. Doesn't mean it's worse, but it's just a different kind of project from R&D to production to facing out the project, maybe eight years, six years, five years. I would expect Cisco's debt to be much more short term. Second, I'm gonna ask you what currency are your cash flows in? Remember that pie chart I had for Disney? Where are your cash flows coming from? If I do a pie chart for your debt, it should be a rough reflection of those cash flows. If you get 70% of your cash flows in dollars, I'd expect to see in your pie chart of debt about 70% of your debt is dollar debt. And then I'll ask a third question and we'll end for today. We're in, the, in a period where everybody's worried about inflation. I'm going to ask you as a company, do you have pricing power? You know what I'm asking, right? As inflation goes up, can you pass that through to your customers? I'm going to argue that if you have pricing power, you're a much better candidate for floating rate debt than if you don't have pricing power. And I'll let you think about that because at the start of the next class, I want you to think about why having pricing power makes you a better candidate for floating rate debt and why not having pricing power means you should stay away from floating rate debt. So I will leave you with that and I will see you on Wednesday. Thank <laughs> you.